we knew what the founder journey was. And we, and we started out very early focusing on how could we help the founders help one another. So not just the traditional venture of, okay, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a, an advisor of this guy. But we created networks of the founders. Well, I found that venture is an extremely introspective job and that you have to know you. You have to know why you're so different. Why is your capital better? And then you have to sell yourself. And if you can't do that, you probably aren't going to be able to win against like the Midas list. I think it's really difficult to be a great investor without a deep set of expertise. Long term, to continue to succeed, I think you will need deep domain knowledge. So being a generalist is unlikely to work. And you will need to develop value add muscles to help companies grow faster, better than they would have without you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Fintech Leaders, coming to you from New York City. I'm your host, Miguel Armasa, and I'm a co-founder of Gilgamesh Ventures, a venture capital fund that backs early stage fintech entrepreneurs in the US, Canada, and Latin America. If you enjoyed this conversation, I invite you to leave a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your shows so more people can learn about fintech leaders. In this special episode, I have compiled the best insight and actionable learnings on what it takes to be a great VC investor from 10 amazing interviews I've recorded over the last two years with early and late stage investors. The partners and leaders featured in this podcast represent firms with a combined 160 billion in assets under management from funds including General Atlantic, Andreessen Horowitz, Lightspeed, and Bain Capital Ventures. If you want to dig deeper and listen to any of the complete episodes, you can find the links on our Substack newsletter. In the first half, we hear from six investors who explain that the hallmark of exceptional VCs extends beyond identifying potential large companies to a profound blend of conviction, collaboration, and deep understanding of the entrepreneurial process. Seasoned investors know that true success stems from a genuine belief in a startup's vision and mission, coupled with the courage to support unconventional ideas. Look, I can tell you from an entrepreneur's perspective, like what you really wanted was somebody to have deep conviction in what you're building, right? And, and honestly not care what other people thought. It was the most frustrating thing in the world as an entrepreneur raising money, when you would talk to investors who would say, who else is in the round? Or I'll invest if, you know, so-and-so invests. I'm like, are you freaking kidding me? Like, just make up your, your own mind. And I think having sort of a, again, conviction in your own ideas, uh, you know, conviction in the entrepreneur, conviction in the thesis, and be willing to kind of plant the flag and be, again, in, in often non-consensus and then the hard part is being right. Um, really, I think are the, are the ways that you can be incredibly successful in, in investing. It's, it's not easy um, doing any of those things. Obviously, I, again, I, I'm still trying to learn and figure out how to be an investor. But, but the people I've admired most are, are, were often the investors who had kind of a clarity of thought, had deep conviction, moved quickly. And, you know, one, in large part because of those qualities. Um, and then when they were proven out to be right far earlier than anybody sort of understood, like that's when those sort of, you know, exponential outcomes, you know, are created. The best piece of, of, of guidance that I've, I've always gotten has been to be in command of the, of the details and to really kind of know my details. Um, and then, you know, to, to make sure that like I prosecute the the business, whatever it is, you know, in in a manner that leaves me with like a clear and moral conscious. Um, and then the third one is to always keep in mind that like the acceptability of your message is not just a function of like the words that leave your mouth, but how they leave your mouth. And so like making sure to be attuned to the room, the audience, um, you know, as as a way to kind of pro progress whatever um, investment idea or message or thesis or, you know, business idea that that you have is um, is critically important. 
And by year three, we said, okay, well, this is going to be real. So let's make a real fund. So we called that first round capital two. And we did go to Dave Swenson at Yale, who was sort of the dean of venture investing, who said to us, look, I like you guys. You know, you've got age uh, in my, and experience with Howard. You've got you know, a lot of operating experience with Josh and some invest, good investing experience as well. He said, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll give you $20 million. That won't move my needle because you know, I, yeah, I've got a $20 billion endowment, but I'll, well, let's try it. Um, well, you know, a couple of things happened in that fund. We did 70 companies. And as you point out, today's market cap is about $150 billion. It's, It was higher because Uber went out at 65, Roblox went out at 85. So those two alone were 140 and then Square and Double Verified. Um, look, it, it, their luck plays a role, clearly, right? Uh, you know, to have both Uber and Roblox in the same fund was kind of insane. Uh, Princeton and Yale each got back around a billion dollars. It moved their needle, both of them. <laughs> they both gave us awards of various guys and so on. Uh, but what it was, was that we were very simpatico with uh, founders. Josh had founded a couple of companies. I had actually founded uh, Frank Electronic Publishers. So we knew what the founder journey was. And we, and we started out very early focusing on how could we help the founders help one another. So not just the traditional venture of, okay, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a, an advisor of this guy. But we created networks of the founders so that when a CEO had a question, he or she could put it out on our, uh, we had initially a Yahoo group later on, the special software, uh, and it would be seen and answered very quickly. And we had, because we had so many companies, we had about 150 companies, uh, you got answers very quickly. So a lot of other venture firms at the time tried platforms, but they had 20 companies and you know, it wasn't enough to create the network effect. Ours did. So if you were a CTO of a, of a six-person company, all of a sudden we gave you a peer group of 100 CTOs. And if you said, gee, should I be using Node.js or this other framework, you'd get six answers back, You know, four of which would say, yeah, we've been using it. It's great. You should use it. Someone else say, here are the problems with it. So we allowed this, the... the um, the entrepreneurs to help one another, as well as first round having a team to help them. And that, I think, was a big piece of the both the success of the companies, but also the founders telling their friends who are starting companies, go to first round. They're, they're the right place to, to fund. And if, if they'll fund you, you're, you're in great shape. I would say boldness. You know, the um, not just being willing or actually being attracted to the non-obvious, uh, being comfortable being wrong, being comfortable looking foolish. I think there's also uh, a founder archetype that is transgressive. Um, and so you might feel more comfortable backing founders who are like you or with whom you're deeply sympathetic or uh, with whom you want to spend a huge amount of time, that's not always the right answer. Sometimes the right answer is backing founders that make you uncomfortable. You know, there's a bright line around ethics, but there's there are fewer bright lines around style. Uh, and some of the most interesting companies are built by founders that are bold to the point of being controversial. And so I think a great investor has to sift through their own biases with a great deal of self-knowledge and, and really question the aversions that come up, you know, question when they're shying away from something and, and parse out, maybe there's something appealing about that that I need to actually lean into. So that's a, it's a nuanced point, but it's really important. And when I, I see investors, you know, I see deals announced, for instance, and I, and I I know the person, I respect them. I, that's where I, that introspection, I think is an important motion for an investor. Um, then I think uh, this is a multi-round game. You know, it's a game of reputation. And the other thing that distinguishes great investors in my experience are those that deliver on their promises. Um, you can get through a cycle or two by being a good salesperson, um, which I, and I wish I were a better salesperson, but I, I do think uh, at the end of the day, you know, founders have an experience with you and more and more, 
and I'm not talking about websites where people leave reviews of venture capitalists, but more and more the um, the world is a transparent place. And so the the best investors are the ones who understand their reputation matters and deliver on the promises they make. And generally that means just standing with founders when they need you. It's easy when everything's going great and it gets much harder when things are challenging. And this poses, you know, it seems like a kind of a basic thing to say, but it's a radical time management problem. You know, you advance your career a decade, two decades, and there's a lot of barnacles on the boat. You know, there's a lot of obligations you've taken on and they don't really tend to go away. You know, they tend to accumulate. And so figuring out how to allocate your time and energy between your partners, your junior colleagues, obviously the founders that you've, you know, pledged your time and capital to, new founders who you want, um, you know, in the family, and then the ecosystem uh, of employees, potential future founders, financial institutions. You know, we host a demo day along with NICA and QED, you know, we had 500 executives from major financial institutions there to, to see our portfolio companies. Those are 500 relationships. You know, those are folks who might call me up and want to get coffee. You can't really like, you know, have a quarterly check-in with, you know, 500 people in addition to your day job. So I think like waking up in the morning and, and asking yourself a set of deliberate questions about how you're spending your time is an important skill for investors. You know, we have this incredible job you and I both, where we have this luxury of, you know, sitting here and having a bunch of fortune tellers come into our office every day. Uh, and, you know, we get to synthesize, you know, these different visions that we hear into something that's coherent to us. Um, and so I view the job not so much as predicting the future as it is weaving together these strands of predictions, you know, that we benefit from um from these founders and whether that's meeting new founders or in board meetings uh which you know comprise most of my day uh the job is a job of synthesis and articulation more than it is actual predictions um and you know embedded financial services was observing what you know, Mike Prager was doing it at Avid Exchange and Flint at Bill Trust and Mike Massaro at Flywire, landing with this software footprint, the sticky data-rich software, and then monetizing through payments or increasingly through credit, um, and then putting words around that and data around that. So I think it can, I wouldn't want to overstate, you know, how actually creative the job is, um, but you do have to be a keen observer venture is a sales job and you have to have a lot of stamina you have to have that reserve of energy in yourself that you can always pull out to smile at a founder like listen to their story intently even though it's like the 15th pitch you've heard that day and just like a salesperson know you're going to do that every single day for the foreseeable future <laughs> maybe not 15 pitch calls a day but you know still having tons of pitch calls having a lot of energy for them and to just keep going even though the answer of almost all of them is no and so that's a big, you know, I think learning everyone has to like understand and be comfortable with. And I see a lot of people turn out from venture who aren't great with that. Um, the other thing I would say, another big learning is you are selling capital, but you're really selling yourself because capital is a commodity and you can get it in a lot of different formats and a lot of different product packages in a lot of places. And so, especially in, you know, the type of companies we're trying to invest in the best of the best, they have a lot of options. And so I found that venture is an extremely introspective job and that you have to know you, you have to know why you're so different, why is your capital better, and then you have to sell yourself. And if you can't do that, you probably aren't going to be able to win against like the Midas list, you know, um, where the brand is, is kind of taking over. So I think about that a lot, all the time. Um, tons more more lessons, I think, also on just kind of like the job, working with founders, how to be the best board member, being a coach, not a dictator, obviously, is then this the way to go from a board member perspective, but also a lot of learnings around working with your other board members and just being aligned with them. 
I don't think I realized how important that was going to be in the beginning. But now that we're in 2023, the tough year, I've called it, like having lots of conversations, alignment to influence, because we're not private equity. We don't own the company. You can't tell people what to do. You have to influence what to do. And so that is really a lot of like collaborative persuasion, influence work that goes on, not just with you and the founder, but the other board members too. The one thing I will always try to remind myself of is the most you can lose is your invested capital. And so you can only lose one X. And if you're, if you're building a diversified portfolio, if you actually look at it, because I've done this recently where, you know, got companies in this market that have struggled. And you, I say to myself, uh, man, if this five, seven, $10 million investment doesn't work out, like what is that going to do to our fund returns? And you actually start to look at it and it's actually quite minor because you've got a lot of companies. And so I think the mistake I've made, and I think what's very, it's very human nature to focus on the loss and loss ratios. And there's a real aversion to loss. And I really try to remove that from my thinking um, when I'm thinking about an investment. And I'm really thinking about the, the mistake that I think oftentimes I made and others can make is that you, you invest, um, and the, the, the opportunity wasn't big enough. That's where I think you're, you can go wrong. I'd much rather lose my invested capital on a deal, but every single investment I made has an opportunity to be a three, five, 10, 20 billion dollar company. And that's really hard to, to do. And it's really hard to have the patience to wait because those don't come around every single day. So you have to have the patience to wait for the for those for those companies. So that that's a, a broad, I would say, kind of l- lesson I've learned. Um, and then where, again, where I've where I've come, where I've been wrong, where I have lost my money, is not following my gut on something. Where um, I would I've been convinced or talked into a deal either by the founder or by others around where. I, I wasn't a hundred percent bought in, and it's usually, again, probably a, a, a misread on the founder. And so we often have the saying: if it's not hell yes, it's it's hell no. And so <laughs> sometimes it hasn't been a hell yes, but we've done the deal, and I've done the deal, and that's just kind of that's just a wrong framing. For the second half of this show, we will learn from four investors about why true greatness is defined by a combination of sector-specific expertise, a collaborative approach, and an insightful grasp of the entrepreneurial path. The best investors tend to agree that success is achieved through a comprehensive strategy that integrates thematic investing with deep sector knowledge, emphasizing the need for specialization in a global perspective. Ultimately, it's results, of course, uh, is what you know shows you whether or not an investor is good. But what can that's those are just the that's the output. Um, what determines whether or not somebody will be successful? I think it feels like there's two schools of thought, and um, I'll let you know which side I land on. But just just to frame it up, one school of thought is like I'm just a big brain, you know, kind of. Uh, computer equivalent, like looking for pat, like ingesting data and looking for patterns and trying to, you know, kind of identify money-making opportunities based on that, upon those patterns. Like that's, I think, you know, kind of one school of thought. Um, and I think the, I, I should say that underpins both, but like one is very much about like a theme and a thesis and like an investment strategy. Um, and I think the other one is about just people. That's just like, I have insights towards people or I have a great network, you know, and I'm leveraging that network and harness, like extracting value out of it. And ultimately, like anything, it's like the truth is probably a blend of the two of those. Um, I think from our perspective, we view the people side of this as like a table stakes thing of like, you can't, you can't be successful investing in startups, especially the types that we invest in, which are relatively early stage without there be a, being a heavy reliance on high talent, high, high quality talent, um, and a commitment to continue to invest in talent, uh, along the way for your best startups. 
Um, that's just that's just part of the job. But I think for us, we don't see it like the ability to uniquely differentiate ourselves based upon just a view on talent or talent network. There might be people in in, in our sector who who would feel like they can and they have very unique strategies towards that. But I think for us, we view that is really, really important to be thematic if you're going to be sector focused. And so having a thesis, um, investing in a company that like fits with the way you see that thesis unfolding um, and having a source of capital and a capital deployment approach that matches, you know, kind of that theme development uh, and your ability to invest in companies like we, we view those those things as it like lining all of that up in a way that um, that is cohesive and well aligned uh, and makes you a friend, not a competitor, to other great investors who are also you know kind of in in our space. That ends up being, I think, what what I th- I, I suspect will make somebody believe that I'm a good investor. I believe for the tech ecosystem. To thrive, we need to be collaborative. When, when what, and there was a perfect ex- experiment. If you compare Route 128 in the East Coast to Silicon Valley in the West Coast, highly competitive, highly individualistic, highly s- s- closed in culture on the East Coast, and a very collaborative culture on the West Coast, one became a hundred and um, maybe a thousand times more significant uh, over the course of the 90s. So in, in, in young, rapidly evolving industries, I would suggest, and we believe this as a firm, collaboration is, is a win-win for, for, for us and for, for the community and, and for the development of, of the industry. Uh, in, in, specifically in Latin America, uh, my partners are, and I have tried to be collaborative with the venture community and some of our competitors and the regulator and, and so forth. And I think it has paid off. And today we have an ecosystem that's showing signs of critical scale and where the multiple cases of successful companies that have tapped the market and, and new services being, 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 being rendered. What makes a great investor? There, there, there are many attributes of a great, a, a great, uh, a great investor. What we look for in, when we partner with other investors is do they think like us in terms of long-term value creation? Are, are, are we aligned on a vision of long-term value creation with no shortcuts, which are emphasis on quality and customer success? And uh, if you are, uh, may the best idea win and let us work together in, in, in that long journey. The industry will get more competitive. There's clearly more capital coming into the industry um, and long term, to continue to succeed, I think you will need deep domain knowledge. So being a generalist is unlikely to work. And you will need to develop value add muscles to help companies grow faster, better than they would have without them. If you have those two things, uh, you will do well. And I think the third one, which we're betting on, is being truly global. Glo- the globalization of entrepreneurship, the tearing down of trade barriers globally, the integration of the financial system means most companies will have to face global markets in due course. And to be able to be a good partner to them, you should be as global as they intend to be. So I think you know, domain knowledge, value add muscles, and globality will increasingly become important in a more competitive market. I think it's really difficult to be a great investor without a deep set of expertise. And in fairness, you see that even in the journalist funds, right? People tend to specialize. But when you have the benefit of truly developing deep expertise across only financial services, you have the luxury of going very deep across many subsectors and to understand how they interrelate and where the dependencies are and where things break down. And I would go as far as to say part of the reason I'm proud that we built a global fund was because we not only have that visibility in the US, we have that visibility globally. And it's not to say there aren't differences across regions, of course there are, but there's also some similarities. And when they do hold, there's some really powerful cross-learning. And you can only do that if you start to really deeply um, specialize and you build an ecosystem that's very specialized and you, you, you know, learn 
and develop partners that are very specialized. And that feeds such a powerful ecosystem, both domestically, but also internationally. And so I think um, the importance in doing that is really making sure you've got the right type of employees, you've got the right type of culture, and you have to have the right type of presence, like local presence to really enable that to happen in, in a successful way. I think among the co-investors, and, and this is, probably speaks a little bit more to just me personally, I, I really appreciate, there's a lot of smart folks. The folks that we've been, we found to be um, the best co-investors have a real high sense of, high sense of EQ, um, highly humil- EQ, like humble in the greatest sense of the word. Um, collaborative, open, uh, a real desire to roll up our sleeves together and see that as kind of a joint effort. Um, And I think the sharp elbows just don't seem to exist as broadly in fintech anyway, but I would say that, you know, there's just a really great like team mindset overall. Um, Obviously they need to be smart and thoughtful and all that good stuff, but that goes without saying. It's really in my mind a lot more of the softer skills um, that, that have really created what I think is the most successful outcome so far. As we invest today, we realize a few things are important to us when what 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 is important from our toolbox and what we're looking for when we invest in when we co-invest. So I think local presence is an obvious first important thing. And but what is not obvious is why it is important. You can actually invest into any African market sitting in London, in New York, anywhere, you will see the deal flow probably. And you will be able to spot really good entrepreneurs and invest in them. I think the local presence come into play when you are thinking about, um, you know, investing from a real practical understanding of the market, you know, the problems and the industries and the value chains these startups aim to disrupt. Because as, for instance, fintech becomes more and more sophisticated, what these fintechs are building becomes more and more complex and difficult to understand. And you really need to get it from, you know, that practical knowledge of what they are talking about. And then second, this presence and proximity and engagement will allow you to, you know, build hooks into the business ecosystems. And we look at this when we are talking to global investors. A diverse operations background in the investor team is important to us. Uh, again, just so that you can speak from a place where you've done these things and you can really be a good, you know, advisor and sparring partner to the company. 